it's 1 p.m. Uh, let's wait for everyone to kind of get back in here um, to the uh, second talk of the day. Uh, let's wait another minute or so to get some more participants, and then I will uh, introduce myself and introduce our speaker. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Quirk. I am a graduate student and one of the moderators and uh, one of the moderators and kind of organizers of this event. So we're just working on getting the live stream set up and some of the other technical um, aspects of the talk. And then I will be happy to introduce our speaker. Okay, great. So like I said, I'm Nick. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the um, general features of this afternoon's talk. If you have a question, um, you can just use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to add the question. And if you have a question that you see that seems to be really pertinent for the moment, uh, you can ask your question and then raise your hand. And then we can uh, enable your microphone so that you can ask it aloud. Otherwise, we prefer to keep the majority of the questions to the end um, so our speaker can, can address them then. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, this afternoon's speaker. Um, this is Professor uh, Zahid Hassan from Princeton. He's the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics. And his group is really famous and has a long history for doing a lot of exciting predictions and discoveries of all kinds of wonderful quantum materials. So uh, his talk is going to be about topological magnets in 2D and 3D. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Professor Hassan. Thank you. Um... Thank you. Let me share my screen. Just a sec. Okay, good. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, and especially the organizers for putting this uh, all of this together, uh, and also giving me the opportunity to speak at this workshop. So I will talk about this topological magnets in 2D and 3D. The technical terms for these things are like churn magnet, Kagome magnet, and wild magnets. And the idea behind this thing is that we'll also uh, uh, try to go over uh, the details why and how these things are topological or could be made uh, topological in, in certain, certain sense. Okay, so uh, I will start out, out uh, with the broad introduction that uh, uh, by now, over the last 20 years or so, there's a large number of topological materials in the, in the field. Uh, probably much of the excitement started with the topological insulators, uh, after quantum hull type of stuff. But then um, uh, one exciting thing about topological insulators is that uh, these, these, these systems have a 3D realization. So that made it possible to, uh, to manipulate these materials for, uh, real, to realize other phases of matter, like I mean, you can magnetize a topological insulator, and realize some sort of magnets, topological magnets with some sort of uh, band structure, topological twist in the band structure introduced by magnetism. And uh, also uh, like topological semi-metals and a number of other things. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, and then, I mean, you could also start out, uh, uh, introduce superconductivity and find uh, topological objects there. So in this talk, I will mostly focus on magnetism, uh, but uh, just, just to get you a feel that a lot is happening. There are so many exciting research directions that are opening up uh, in this field. And this particular talk will focus on three types of magnets. Okay, so this is the overview of the talk, which will have a focus on uh, primarily on based on our knowledge of 2D topological magnets, uh, how much uh, we can explore, how much we can realize uh, topological magnetism or topological band structure 
in magnet in uh, in three dimensional magnets and how magnetism could play a, a critical role in realizing the topological twist okay and i will be mostly focusing on spectroscopic signatures and at some point i'll insert uh, some transport signature in connection to spectroscopic uh, studies uh, in support of that but it will be primarily on spectroscopic study so the specific topics i'll cover is i'll give a one or two minute introduction to magnetic topological insulators starting with what was happening in 2010 and how uh, the developments uh, back there led to this new uh, new excitement in the field uh, leading to churn gap 2d magnets uh, which in spectroscopy community we call it hedgehog magnets in transport community those are quantum anomalous hull states uh, and and then how the ideas concept develops in 2D could uh, lead to realization of uh, topological physics like file line objects in uh, 3D magnets. And uh, I'll also introduce this Kagome magnet, how Kagome lattice can <clears throat> lead to new magnetism that uh, which has flat band and Dirac Fermi on both. And, uh, and Kagome magnets can be a, uh, uh, powerful, I mean, useful host to realize all sorts of magnets, uh, topological objects, uh, churn, not only churn uh, magnets, it could be a host for vial magnets and also for uh, probably in future fractional quantum, um, fractional quantum anomalous hull, but fractional churn type stuff. And I will also insert a few unpublished new results, uh, especially I'll announce our recent discovery of a new class of churn magnet, churn magnets in the quantum limit. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not published or posted yet. Okay, so let me start out uh, thanking my students and collaborators. Much of what I will show in this talk is a collective, enormous amount of collective effort uh, led by Su Yang Du, Ilya Bilopolsky, Jashin In, Go Ching Chan, Sonia Zhang, and Guang Bian, and the entire group, uh, a large number of other members of the groups are involved. And uh, we, we uh, on sample side, we collaborate with uh, uh, with number of groups worldwide. Uh, especially, I would like to mention Shuang Jia and his students and postdocs, Feng Cheng Chiu and Ramon Shankar, Claudia Felser, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, chemistry groups around the world. Uh, and then we'll mention. We'll uh, mention other, uh, I will mention our theoretical work and also group uh, work by other groups uh, when it comes in context. And we use facilities around the world, uh, especially Berkeley, uh, uh, Stanford, and also our lab at Princeton. Okay, so one thing I will not do is I'll not be reviewing the instruments and the experimental instrumental developments that led to these new experiments. Uh, it, it, there is a close tie between that. And typically when I talk in summer school, some students expect to give me some sort of instrumental overview. But in this talk, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, time for that. But uh, I would like to refer you to a number of review papers we wrote uh, that has uh, some of the instrumental develop, instrumentation development uh, review there. Without these instrumentation development over uh, a period of 15 years, we could not be doing topological physics. And, and much of what we did, the experimental methodologies we introduced, and in, in some cases we introduced a number of terminology to describe certain uh, spectroscopic physics. This is now, uh, they, this has now become a common uh, uh, term have become a common become common terms in the field, and it's now even appearing in number of uh, most recent textbooks. Okay, so I will I'll skip the instruments, uh, and uh, you can look up the review if you're interested. In. Okay, so uh, I would say 
uh, although quantum Hall state is time reversal broken, you apply a field. Uh, typically, uh, much of the community became interested in probing magnetism in topological materials in, 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 in with the advent of topological insulators. Uh, so the, some of the earliest ideas were just take a topological insulator, bismuth selenide or telluride, for example, and introduce magnetic dopants and see what happens. So this was driven by the idea that since uh, this Z2 topology is protected by, it's the time reversal invariance that's protecting it. If by introducing magnetic dopants, uh, you break time reversal symmetry, you open a gap at the Dirac point. So that would be the beginning of the fun. So uh, even before 2010, this is uh, in, in my review in 2010, we already reviewed how much work was going on in magnetizing topological insulators, uh, bismuth selenide and telluride, for example. Uh, in this particular data set, we were doping, not in the bulk, we are doping we, inside the ARPES chamber, we are doping on the surface. We're depositing magnetic atoms on the surface and creating uh, a, a magnetized or quasi-magnetized layer near the surface and probing with, uh, with spin polarized photo emission that what happens to the Dirac cone. And uh, there are not a number of experimental challenges there, but uh, the appearance of some sort of gap was evident that the Dirac cone, but uh, this did not clearly create uh, a sense or spectroscopic characterization of what we now call a charm insulator or charm magnet. Uh, uh, so, so we, so one of the one of the experimental procedure or methodology we developed is uh, somebody gives us a magnet. It could be dope topological insulator or some intrinsic magnet. Experimentally, spectroscopically, how do we know that this is something is topological about this magnet? So, so this is what I'll focus on. So this this part. So we realize early on that just doping topological insulators with magnets it may introduce gap, but it doesn't do anything good beyond that. So we have to go into a systematic growth mode. So we were collaborating with Nitin Shamart on this work, we were uh, growing films of uh, 3D topological insulators and we were using ARPES, we were probing when the Dirac cone opens a gap in the non-magnetic systems uh, because uh, the top and bottom surface can talk to each other, they couple, uh, there, there's, so that will open a gap, but this has nothing to do with magnetic gap. And by probing the spin texture, we could tell whether the film gap seen in the film, either in transport or spectroscopy, whether it has magnetic origin or not. There's a very clear signature for that. So in other words, we know, uh, given a topological insulator film, we can tell by doing ARPES, uh, spin ARPES, uh, whether the film is in the 3D limit or in the 2D limit. Hey, for example, here you're in the 2D 3D limit, you have a Dirac cone protected here. These are all non-magnetic, here you have a gap. So now, uh, the idea that evolved from this class of experiments is that since we can probe the spin texture near the edge of the gap, we should be able to tell whether we have a trivial gap or a chemical gap or a churn gap. So, so that's, that's the first important development uh, we had. So let's say, uh, first of all, we have to uh, we have to see that the, near the surface of the film is magnetized. So, so one of the uh, ideas we applied uh, uh, is that we could look at the surface circular dichroism, in other words, coming with uh, right-handed and left-handed uh, light of different helicity and look at whether there is a dichroic signal uh, in the optical channel. That's one signature that there is some sort of magnetism. It could be homogeneous or inhomogeneous, doesn't matter. We could also look at the uh, uh, hysteresis magnetic, uh, mag in the magnetization channel. If there is a history, uh, there is a hysteresis, clear his uh, loop, and this loop is correlated with a gap, and it's opening or closing, then we could say that there is something, the spectroscopic gap 
is has some magnetic origin and also the gap is likely to disappear or substantially get filled up as we raise temperature is we raise temperature when magnetism the magnetic order is destroyed then the gap magnetization is destroyed the gap should also close so these were our spectroscopic uh, signatures that we are uh, approaching finding or optimizing a churn magnet uh, to take this further we can also add a spin polarized measurement uh, spin rps in this case and see if the if there is a gap this this gap could be uh, it may not be at the fermi level but it, it's at the dirac uh, uh, at the otherwise dirac node so then if this uh, this is this gap has magnetism or magnetic origin then the spin texture would be disrupted near the gap uh, in other words uh, let's say if i chemically dope the system on the surface or in the bulk and place my fermi level here i should see a I should see a, um, a spin polarized surface state, uh, uh, sp uh, spin polarized surface from the surface because the sample is magnetic or at least uh, near the surface it's magnetic. So this, uh, so we combined these three diagnostics and came up with a way to experimentally resolve the issue that somebody gives you a sample, magnetic sample or magnetic film, uh, whether that film it has a churn gap or not, right? And then if, uh, so we could, uh, we could further dope the, we could further test the origin of this gap by increasing magnetic concentration, then gap is likely to increase. And if you uh, increase non-magnetic uh, dopant in the system, uh, gap would be uncorrelated to that. Uh, lost something there. Okay, so, um, and then uh, finally, we could also check as we raise temperature uh, beyond the magnetic transition, what happens, uh, whether, uh, uh, whether the gap remains or disappears, or uh, this spin texture disruption remains or disappears. So we found that if the gap is, um, is not due to magnetism, then if, you're, if you place your chemical potential near the gap, there is no spin polarized Fermi surface there. Uh, you can see, for example, if you have a thin film where top and bottom surface couple to each other, talk to each other, then that also creates a gap, but its spin texture is very different from here. For example, here it's uh, polarization up here is down, here it is zero. So we do have a very clear spectroscopic diagnostic tool uh, to uh, to identify that, uh, identify churn magnetism, okay? So then, uh, so this, uh, then, then we can also map this uh, spin texture uh, as a function of binding energy. As we go deeper, uh, far below the gap energy scale, we'll see that at some point, the Berry phase that the topological insulator surface at uh, the chiral uh, spin texture that uh, very is a helical spin texture that creates a Berry phase, the Berry phase will recover. But as we approach low energies near the Fermi level, near the gap, the Berry phase will disappear. So this we call Berry phase tunability, but through a surface gating. So now if, if I surface gate this sample, for example, we did that with uh, NO2 doping on the surface. Then we place the Fermi level in the gap. Now we see if we do a spin texture measurement, the spin polarization is up here. So that means uh, now very phase is zero. Uh, so, so in other words, by NO2 surface gating, we can tune the very phase. So this, so, so this, this, this was uh, even further check that uh, indeed, this magnet is a churn magnet. Now you, you, you might say that, okay, if this is a churn magnet, then there should be an edge state, Haldane model, right? Or quantum anomala, is there a quantum anomalous house uh, signal in this sample? So you have to realize that uh, we are doing all of this stuff in under UHP and we cannot uh, do transport here. Even if we could try transport, maybe the sample mobility is not high enough for us to uh, observe all that uh, exotic physics. So that's uh, a bit disheartening, but as far as a spectroscopic 
proof only, we, we, we exhausted all the possibility to pinpoint, identify how to uh, uh, tell whether something is a churn magnet or not. So the second, uh, so then after developing this technology, this experimental methodology or a set of uh, uh, experimental subroutines, we started to explore other systems. So one, uh, one class of magnets uh, that are of interest is the Skagoma magnets. They're uh, theoretically, uh, uh, they're interested, interest, they are, theorists have had interest in them for a long time. And what is exci inter really exciting about them is that even in the non-interacting, just in a tight binding model, uh, in a, by putting electrons on a Kagome lattice, you get Dirac fermion at the K point, and you get uh, nearly dispersionless flat band all over. So that means uh, you, have, uh, you have both Dirac fermion and flat band. You know, flat band appears in say heavy fermions and Dirac fermions in graphene. So by tuning chemical potential in Kagome magnets, you could realize all sorts of uh, physics there. So, uh, so then we applied, uh, we tried to apply our churn gap diagnostic technology to explore whether some of these uh, Kagome magnets people claim based on transport, whether uh, there is a Kagome physics or not, or there's a topological, uh, uh, for the Dirac fermion case, if, if you have a mag magnetic uh, uh, out of plane magnetism, uh, out of plane magnetization, then this Dirac fermion will open a gap, so will create a massive Dirac bar gap. So then if this is really the case, the sample ha really has out of plane magnetism and a Dirac fermion, then its spectroscopic signature, whether it's in a charm state is, would be like this just as what we demonstrated in the topological insulator uh, case. So this is a, you can call it bulk spin texture for a churn magnet. I mean, you can also show that theoretically this would be the signature. But then again, here, we don't access the uh, edge state. Like you could say in a tra beautiful transport measurements from uh, the group in Beijing, uh, Chikun Shui group, they have shown this quantum anomalous solid state. Uh, uh, so, one of the goals in my lab has been for a long time since the beginning of topological insulator is to find the churn magnet naturally, uh, utilizing our chemistry and physics and materials intuition together. So, uh, so along that line, uh, we, uh, we search a number of compounds. I'll show just one, uh, and then I'll go to a new compound that we haven't published yet, but it seems like there is a very exciting compound where we can uh, act, we have access to the edge state through, at least through STM. Um, so uh, one of the earliest compounds we studied is this iron tin compound. It has, it's, um, it has two terminations, iron tin and uh, tin termination. Uh, iron tin termination is the, uh, is the Kagome lattice there. And the low energy physics come from iron tin. Uh, what we discovered in this compound on the iron tin surface with STM that if we don't apply any magnetic field, this, uh, this six-fold system, uh, this uh, the hexagonal lattice, if, if, if you consider the two uh, bilayer Kagome system, then you could say it's three-fold structurally. Uh, then if you apply a field, even without applying any field, when we look at the quasi-particle interference in using STM, we see a clear two-fold signature. Uh, and then not only that, uh, of course, uh, two-fold electronic bands doing that, electronic interference doing that is a, is a signature, potential signature for uh, some sort of pneumatic we'll talk about in polarized electron systems. But what is interesting in this particular Kagome magnet that as we, uh, uh, in all the, on the systems where uh, such electronic like pneumaticity uh, discovered, it's always, uh, it just fits there. I mean, you cannot tune it uh, uh, so easily except for pressure. It turned out that in this particular compound, we can dial the pneumaticity. We can, by, up, by rotating the field, depending on how we apply the field, you can see that now 90 degree that it's, so in other words, it's field tunable 
uh, two-dimensional thing. And then uh, the fact that the, the underlying lattice is six-fold, we can achieve that when we apply strong enough field out of plane. Now we can see it is a four-fold. And now we have so much quasi-particle interference data by analyzing that by extra, we can extract a dispersion relation. Uh, and then that dispersion relation is consistent with the system having a massive Dirac band. Although um, you need, uh, uh, in fact, in my view, you need spin arpas to prove that you have a churn magnet, uh, churn gap here. Uh, but there is plenty of evidence. But uh, so far, as far as I know, no, no, not only our group, no other group has succeeded in seeing the um, uh, chiral edge state in the system. So we, we keep searching. So let me skip that. This is a technical detail. And by the way, the uh, twofold uh, pneumatic light thing we see in, ST, in our STM, it's also it's consistent with what is seen in transport. Transport results are by Chuang Zia's group. And there are a number of theoretical ideas what might this be due to. One, uh, one of them is the spin body phase, the gauge flux creates uh, anomalous gap dependence on this system. The gap should increase with a field, but it, in, in our case, it decreases. So there is some uh, 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 many body physics there. It's not a simple, churn magnet. Uh, we are still searching for, for a simple churn magnet. So uh, to sum up what I said, so what I mentioned so far, that back in 2012 or so, uh, we were doing spin texture to identify churn gap, but we could not see churn gap or quantum anomalous Hall state in that system. Uh, a year later, in chromium dope bismuth uh, compounds, the uh, quantum anomalous Hull state was reported, but that's at very low temperature. But uh, churn gap is very small, and its spin characterization has not happened yet. Uh, it's not clear whether this will lead to a higher temperature, say, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature or room temperature churn gap, uh, churn magnet. In 2018, this iron-based Kagome magnets, we reported this churn gap-like thing, but very complex thing. And uh, um, no edge states were clearly seen. And the anomalous Hall effect being intrinsic was reported by the MIT group. So the goal remains in the field, in, the, in this topological, 2D topological magnet field. So to sum up, what I think is, is the goal is that identify or make a 2D churn magnet in the quantum limit where edge states are accessible. I mean, it, it, it may be theoretically there, but if experimentally, if you don't access it, it's not fun. Landau levels are accessible and churn gap is large. I would say it's at least more than 25 millivolts. And also in an interacting limit, there should be some many body physics, you know, twisted bilayer graphene that led to some many body physics. Um, later on, I will show some of the churn magnets do have uh, intrinsic many body physics, like condo lattice type physics, if I have time. So, uh, so this is the kind of like um, holy grail in this uh, uh, topological magnetism field. So, I'm happy to announce that we have, uh, based on guided by our past experience on topological magnets, we have now discovered a new class of churn magnet with large gap, more than 25 millivolts. And this is, uh, it is not just one magnet, there's a, there's a large number of, there's a family. And uh, this uh, 166 system, so uh, rare earth, and then manganese tin, 66. In this system, there is no additional tin atom in the Kagome plane and the Kagome layers are well separated. So it's not like that iron tin uh, bilayer Kagome, it's a, really effectively single layer Kagome. And there is no ad additional atom in, in there. And uh, it turned out, uh, this is a collaboration between Shuang Jia and my group. And uh, the fact that it is a large gap churn magnet that allows you to access edge state and, um, and also Landau quantization, it's, it's all possible with the work of Jashin In, uh, uh, my STM, uh, team members. Okay, so uh, another remarkable thing is that uh, this, this sample is so clean. It's, it's compared to other Kagome ma uh, magnets that people have studied so far, we compared in our STM. 
setup, you can see that this, this particular compound is remarkably uh, clean. Uh, so, so this immediately tells us that, uh, that there's a lot of fine detail physics possible. So, so let me, um, let me uh, show you some of the data. So, uh, so this is STM line cut on the manganese surface. Uh, as I said, there's no other additional atom in the Kagome plane, so it's a very clean system. So in the line cut uh, at zero field, we see, uh, 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 I mean, in the, in the DIDV line, line map, when we apply a field, we clearly see a, a dramatic modulation of DOS, the uh, density of states, and then we clearly see this uh, sharp levels. And then when we, uh, this, this sample has a, a other cleave, cleavage surface. When we go to non kagome then we see, we don't see that. Maybe the quantization appears at higher field. But clearly uh, in the Kagome, uh, we are interested in Kagome from now. So clearly we, we have signal there. And uh, now we can do a detailed map. And in DIDV map, we can clearly identify this peaks, this uh, uh, Landau level peaks, and then we can see the, explore the fan diagram, and, and then uh, we can extract the parameters by fitting it to a uh, Dirac fermion, a churn gap Dirac fermion uh, related Landau quantization. This is also further supported by our own first principles calculation done by Gochin Cheng, who is a postdoc in my group. And we can see that uh, speed orbit coupling is essential to create this much gap. And then uh, we can also fit the tunneling data, data STM data with, uh, with uh, first principle uh, modeling. So with this four parameter fit, we can find a beautiful fit to the nonlinear um, higher Landau levels and signal in Dirac physics. And then, um, uh, then now, uh, and then this, this, this is fitting this gap. You can see that I said that the goal in the field is to find a churn magnet with gap larger than 25 millivolts. We got something that's uh, 34 millivolt gap and it has a Dirac fit, a massive Dirac fit. Now, uh, now, how do we know? Uh, so one possibility is to do spin arpest to confirm that the gap is actually a churn gap, or we can try to find an edge state, but finding edge state would be very exciting. So here we are showing step edge uh, uh, with STM. Uh, we're exploring that when you, uh, so the Dirac, uh, the, you can see that in the fitting of the Landau levels, the Dirac, uh, point uh, gap energy, I mean, the Fermi level is off by uh, 130 millivolts. And when you go there at the step edge, it, it lights up. So there is an edge state clearly. Now, in order to make sure that this edge state is the chiral uh, churn gap uh, quantum magnet edge state, we also wanted to check that whether it's not an artifact. So uh, we did a side cleave. And we see that um, we see the gap, but there's no edge state. So this is this is uh, this edge state is kind of, uh, related to the Kagome churn plane. Okay, uh, so that's a spectroscopic check. We can also uh, cross check with uh, Shuang's transport data. So when we look at we compare the we feed the transport data, uh, the anomalous hull data, we can see that the, that the, it can be well fitted by the parameters we extracted by doing by fitting to the Landau fan diagram. For example, gap is 34 millivolts, and the Dirac uh, uh, Fermi level is 30, 130 millivolts away. And then that's exactly where we found the edge state, the chiral edge state of the churn gap. So this is really exciting. And then also the numbers match up with trans, transport and STM match up very well. Uh, and then uh, Shuang's group has started to further engineer this material based on uh, a number of experimental results we have seen. Uh, uh, so we are work working, a, working a feedback loop. By electron doping the system, we want to get it close to the churn gap. So we can, uh, uh, so if we, if we can get Fermi level in the gap, then in directly in transport. Uh, so, so far I, I showed edge state in the 
STM uh, spectroscopic channel, uh, which was not possible before in any other channel magnet. Uh, so then now, now we by fitting, now we can engineer the material uh, because we know where the Fermi level is and where to move it. So we can place the Fermi level inside the churn gap and also observe this uh, uh, quantization in the transport channel. So this, we also figured out what is the, how to dope the system. So if you dope it by 1%, uh, 0.1%, uh, uh, I mean, uh, X equal 0.1 uh, in the, replace manganese by iron, then you can reach the quantum limit. And when you dope it more, further electron doping, you, you move away. So this is ongoing research, but this is very exciting. I think uh, this material class, it's not just one material. I showed data on terbium manganese steam compound. Uh, there is a whole lot of magnets in this system. And, and it's so exciting that there is so much to do. Um, um, and I think this is the, so far, this is the largest uh, gap churn magnet where you can see Landau quantization and all of that Dirac, uh, massive Dirac physics. Okay, I, I don't have a uh, lot of time to go into further detail because I have, to, I promise to do talk about 3D as well. Okay, so, so that was 2D. So we, we have ongoing research how to find um, um, uh, even cleaner system or even more uh, interesting system. Uh, one result I skipped here is that in one of these Kagome magnets, we have found uh, that Kagome lattice, uh, that, that uh, condo lattice coherence, many, uh, clear signature of a many body physics. So in other words, we are, uh, we are getting to the regime where this uh, churn magnet topology and quantum many body physics are coming together. This is very exciting time to explore all these magnets. Okay, so now let's move on to 3D. So what is happening in 3D? Uh, so even uh, very until recently, there was no experimental realization of a, that you could genuinely call a 3D topological magnet or, uh, or um, um, that's, I mean, experimentally demonstrated. Of course, there are many theoretical ideas. So um, 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 I will briefly trace the thought since it's a summer school, some pedagogical, how the idea evolves, concepts evolve to lead to new discoveries and results. It's a useful thing. So I will back up a little bit, again, go back to 2010. And what were the ideas that motivated us to what we have we are studying now? So back in uh, 2010, uh, that was, everybody was busy doing topological insulator. Uh, we had a theoretical uh, paper uh, where we were suggesting that, uh, okay, you have topological insulator, great. So we were asking this question, how, do you, how can you start with a band insulator and turn into a topo engineer a topological insulator out of it. The obvious answer was uh, tune spin orbit. So we asked this question in this PRL and PRB that uh, what happens in between when you uh, write at the inversion point. Right at the inversion point, you get a 3D Dirac state, right, because in the bulk, right? So that's your uh, Dirac semi-metal, 3D Dirac semi-metal. And we clearly talked about that in Su Yang Zhu's science paper in 2011. Uh, we also talked about that when you go through a topological phase transition at the bulk 3D Dirac point, you could just magnetize that sample and get vial fermions, a pair of vial fermions. It's all documented in these papers, these ideas, and that those set of ideas. And the challenge again, uh, as always in this field, is finding the right material and, or the material that you can dope and actually see something in transport or in spectroscope. The ideas are not theoretical ideas in my view are not that uh, critical here. It's the experimental the realizing uh, where to find it that requires a lot of materials, chemistry and physics intuition. And we have been combining our materials, physics and chemistry and theory intuition to find those things. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you some of the examples. So in one of the early things we, we, we said that if you have a topological insulator, 
gap at the Fermi level, you, you'll, if you do RPES, you'll see a uh, circle Fermi surface. Uh, it's, it's a, in, in, that's your Fermi surface in, uh, you'll see in RPES, right? On a, for a topological insulator, because you're only seeing surface states. Now, if you close the uh, band, uh, band gap, you can close it in many different ways. I mean, it's, you're, you're deforming the band structure hypothetically. What if you close it at two points, then, then now, uh, the question we asked are these uh, now then you created kind of two arcs connected by bulk points. This is not a topological insulator anymore because there's no gap. I asked Charlie Kane that what happens are should these uh, arc like states when I close the topological insulator gap should be stable. Uh, his answer was no, um, and I clearly remember that. But in experiments, we always see that this is so stable. So there must be some sort of something else topologically protected it. Later on, I realized that this is not in the paper. I realized that in RPES, we don't, we never measure the true real bulk. We, we may be measuring bulk band, but projected near the surface, which is not exactly the same, never ever the same. So that means we were already, the reason our uh, 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 arcs were looked sta always stable. That's because near the surface, we were not resolving it. They were split into volume. They, they got to because the surface terminates. And so the inversion symmetry is broken at the surface, even the bulk band would be modified. So in other words, back then in our data, that stability is already telling us it's because of the vial splitting. Although because of RPS resolution, we could not resolve it. So that idea led to this this new development, and then we found new classes of compounds. But then again, the, the, it's not just the, what the, the bulk band is doing, is there a chiral edge mode in the system? That again, we had to introduce uh, some uh, loop cut idea experimentally that uh, can catch these chiral edge modes that we introduced that in our place that these edge modes co-propagate. If they co-propagate, then you have uh, they, they, they should terminate, they must terminate on wild modes. Okay, so thinking along that same line, uh, as I said, the experimental challenge was that we find stable arcs, but they're not, we cannot find, uh, we cannot see vile splitting. That's because our best resolution is crappy. Uh, but then, so then if we map the whole thing, then it will look like a loop. So this is what uh, uh, later on uh, uh, people, we connect, later on we connected these things, we call them uh, nodal loop or while loop. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, we introduced a number of compounds where this nodal lines could uh, appear, introducing the in, uh, also why this should be topological. Um, what is the invariant? This is not in book of uh, Hooker balance paper. Uh, at least not explicitly. Uh, so we, we figured that these things are topological objects uh, and, um, and we have a handle on it uh, through our experiments and theoretical ideas. So why am, why am I saying this? Because this was crucial in realizing how to find a topological magnet in 3D. Okay, so this, this was the idea. So one possible way to co construct a topological magnet, or if you like a 3D magnet with to clear topological band structure or topological invariant. Some people don't like the word topological magnet because it's too broadly applied and it's maybe a little bit ill-defined. But what I mean clearly mean is that a 3D magnet where magnetism is crucial for uh, maintaining or driving a topological band structure. So, so that's, to me, that's, that's a simple um, way of uh, thinking about it. So then we demonstrated that by playing with these nodal line rings or loops, we can create also, this is just hypothetical, not in any crystal, that what are the topological connectivity of these nodal loops possible? We can imagine they're disconnected, they're disjoint, or they interpenetrate like a hop link. And there are other possibilities. And then we ask this question. This is much of, uh, came from Go Ching Chan. Uh, Chang is a postdoc, theory postdoc in my group. Um, uh, it's all in his paper. Uh, so then the question is, we can imagine these things, but um, 
a real crystal, electronic crystal with band structure, is it possible that these things are uh, realistic, that you could find an electronic, uh, in electronic band structure, this is a possibility. So then we also introduce this um, invariant uh, structure, what type of, uh, under what conditions you could find such a thing. And we did, uh, Gotin did find uh, this, uh, and also Ilya Vilopolsky was involved. So then um, um, we, we, we showed that this type of ideas are possible in this uh, cobalt manganese compound. And um, so the, it turned out that our initial theory was that it should be a hop link type compound. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is the typical thing about theory. You don't immediately know the uh, experiment, the material will realize the exact same thing. So although many ideas were right in this in our theory paper but when we did detailed experiment we found that the uh, the experimental compound is more complex uh, actually this hop link is not exactly realized this part of this ring is touching here okay so this is this is in general true i did not mention that also for topological insulator channel insulator much of the theory, theoretical prediction is broadly there, but when you do experiments, you find that, that they're not quite right. And uh, this is why, you know, there are uh, predictions of 10,000 topological insulators still. Uh, we searched through that and we found that uh, despite all this prediction, there's not even a single topological insulator that has a, a predicted band gap larger than bismuth selenide, which was discovered 10 years ago. So sometimes theory it doesn't uh, lead to experiment. Uh, that's our 15 years of experiment, including our own theory. So I'm giving one example of that. Although the evol evolving the idea is a good idea. Okay, so this is a very complicated system and it has uh, nodal loops and while loops and all that. And since we, I don't have a whole lot of time and I want to get it to the end, I may not uh, walk you through all the details of the band structure, which you may find it boring anyway, but it has a number of loops in the 3D Brian zone that we trace with, uh, with ARPES technology. And, and, and then we identify that, uh, for example, so, uh, so you can see that this line is tracing the crossing, this, uh, the green bands, the crossing point, so this line is tracing that, uh, that crossing. So the number of loops like that in this compound. So we have to go through the nasty work of uh, tracing that. So I'll show you just one example. For example, if you place your, if you're binding in a, if you take a map at binding energy of uh, 0.1 uh, EV, then you see at, at this part of the Brian zone, you see this type of shape, this shape. And then when you go, uh, to 0 0.04 EV farther down, then you see a point. This part has turned into a point. So this shape has turned into a point and then it has opened the other way. So what is happening is that here, we are tracing this point, this, this thing. And then when you go down in energy, then you see, you find the point, this is that point, And then this, this way. So, so this is 3D band topology mapping is a, is a, is a very extensive care, uh, job and one has to be ex extremely careful in, in tracing that. So, um, so then we have done, Ilya Bilopolsky has done much of that work uh, and then uh, mapped out all of that stuff. Now, now, now the biggest claim here is that, okay, if this, these crossings, you know, if you take any random 3D sample, there will be a spaghetti of bands and crossing and all that. How do you know that in the, anything is topological? So one signature is that there must be bulk boundary correspondence. In other words, if you have a topological crossing or something, then in the bulk, there must be a, a surface state signature, that correspondence. So where is the surface state? So, or is there bulk boundary correspondence in this very complex 3D magnet? Okay. So, um, um, so, uh, so we, once we, we trace this, uh, these, these are vial uh, crossings. Once we see that the vial crossings, they, they, they form a loop. And then we know 
where to search for the surface states corresponding to that because we have already done extensive work in mapping out vile, I mean, vile semi-metals. So based on that experience, we could uh, create a bulk boundary uh, contrast. I did not show that in the case of bio semi-metal due to lack of time, but um, you have to believe me or take my word for it that by uh, tuning photon energy and sample scattering geometry, we can uh, identify the surface and bulk. So one uh, obvious signature would be that the, if something is a surface state, if you scan the KZ direction in your ARPES uh, spectrometer, then uh, things will not move because a three, two dimensional object has no, uh, dispar it doesn't disperse in the third dimension. So KZ dispersion would be zero, nearly zero. So this is what we see. So that's how we figured out that these line nodes are uh, on the surface, they connect as drumhead states. And drumhead states are, uh, so we, we start to map that stuff. And then the drum head starts are exciting because uh, compared to the bulk bands in 3D topology vial magnets, um, um, uh, the, the drum head states, because the topology constraints it, it to a nearly flat band or uh, less dispersive band. So this, is, this creates an exciting opportunity that if you want to study uh, strongly correlated and many body physics, in topological magnets, drumhead states would be a fertile ground if we can access it in suitable compound uh, because uh, topology is now dictating, it's reducing the, uh, dictating to reduce the bandwidth. So now all that crazy stuff, if you're not a spectroscopist, you, can, uh, uh, you might not be able to catch me whether I'm, uh, what, whether I'm, telling you a genuine story or not, or whether I made a mistake or my students made a mistake or not, uh, how do you know? So, uh, so we then decided um, to see the, the, to make a map based on what we see in ARPES, we created a very curvature field map or quantum geometry of this sample. So this is the map of the quantum geometry. Now, if we know the quantum geometry of the sample, which is derived from ARPES data, and then if ARPES data is right, it's presenting the right ground state, magnetic ground state, the quantum geometry would be, we, we can extract quantum geometry. Then once we have the quantum geometry, we can calculate transport. Uh, for example, uh, especially anomalous, uh, anomalous hull transport, intrinsic part of the anomalous hull transport. So in other words, you can use trans ARPES data to predict your transport, transport of your sample. This is what Gochin and Ilya has done in collaboration with uh, Kaustav Manna. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, from ARPES, we know where the Fermi level is and uh, we calculate, uh, this the calculated intrinsic part of the anomalous hull and then we find that um, it should be there. It should be around, uh, um, uh, around this, this point. Uh, so then uh, now Kaustav has done transport on this and he's, he concluded that the intrinsic part of the anomalous hull is about 870 standard units, and that's precisely where ARPES prediction places it. So in other words, all the, you know, the, it's very sensitive to where the profile nodes are, the, the very curvature singularity and all of that. So as you approach the singularity, you're, uh, you'll have a larger response. So indeed, uh, ARPES has successfully mapped out the quantum geometry in the system. Um, and that I find is a remarkable development and success for ARPES, at least uh, in identifying a 3D magnet that is topological. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, now as I said, the, 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 the drumhead states uh, are likely to be a fertile ground for probing uh, for probing, uh, for exploring uh, correlated electron physics. And uh, uh, so that, that by itself is, a, is, is I, I would say it, it, it's a very exciting direction. But I would say um, one challenge with this compound, cobalt, manganese, gallium compound, is that it has such a complicated 3D vial line structure 
that the drum head states, if you, uh, if, uh, a naturally cleaved surface you take, we tried to do that with our STM, which did not work very well, that we cannot access the drum head state with STM, which we could do, we could do with ARPES. Uh, so, uh, so one future goal in, in this field or in my lab would be to find a simpler version of this thing where uh, it's a magnetic vial, but it has, um, it has uh, drum head states that are accessible and you can do all sorts of things. Like, like the other example I gave. So initially we studied a number of Kagome compounds. We could not find anything you can see, uh, edge state or Landau quantization or any of that stuff, but then search further searching around, we could discover something where uh, we could see those additional fine details. So we, as uh, the future direction of this quantum geometry and uh, topological magnet is, is, in my view, is in that direction. So, so uh, for now, I cannot show you some cool many body effect in this compound on the surface, but hopefully uh, a few years down the line. But there is little um, interesting news uh, that in some of the Kagome, existing Kagome magnets we found, that uh, we already studied that we can find some sort of many body resonance, uh, uh, condo lattice type thing, um, and which requires, this is with STM, which requires uh, modeling the system in a Kagome Hubbard model sense. And then it has interesting temperature dependence. It, it, it has much of the um, uh, signs and signature of uh, final resonance that uh, you, other, you typically see in condolatis uh, uh, materials in heavy fermions and other stuff. So I think this is an exciting direction. Okay, so I reach my conclusion. So, um, so I would say it took us 10 years to start with a doped topological mag uh, insulators becoming magnetic and developing the te spectroscopic technology and experimental diagnostics to identify churn gap. And then the knowledge and the experience gained over that period of time, we could finally discover something where you can actually see edge state, at, at least in transport. So this is really exciting to me. Uh, and then again, um, with the knowledge gained from uh, 3D topological insulators applying to Dirac and Weil nodal line thing, this knowledge, we could apply this knowledge to find a, a 3D magnet with topological band structure. And uh, moreover, the, the one I showed, it has, it's a, already a room temperature uh, topological magnet. So that's very interesting. Uh, not all topological objects you can uh, find at room temperature. Okay, so um, then on the Kaigame thing, we find many body physics in systems that are complicated, but um, we are beginning to see edge states and, and, um, and Landau quantization and, and, and all of that, at least uh, STM and transport data agree with each other. Uh, which is very exciting. And uh, I would say the most exciting thing in my lab on the, on the magnet side, we're doing other stuff like superconductors and like, uh, like field-free platform from our on a zero mode and other things. We have other excitements, but in the magnet, magnetic line, the exciting is that uh, we found a new class of uh, churn magnet in the magnet not just one magnet, a family of magnets in the quantum limit, which is the largest gap, and uh, at least from STM looks very clean. It's the cleanest Kagome magnet uh, STM community has seen or published so far. Okay, so uh, with that, I thank everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for organizing the meeting and listening to my talk. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, now, thank you for a wonderful talk. Now we have some time to um, address some questions from the audience. So people are writing in the questions in the chat box and I will vocalize them for us. But if anyone has a particular question they think would be better to, to ask vocally themselves um, to Professor Hassan, then just 
write your question in the, in the um, Q&A box and then also raise your hand. And we can allow that after we do a couple of the pre-written questions from earlier in the talk. So Professor Hassan, the first question is, how does the gap depend on temperature in a, magno in a magnetically doped TI? Does it disappear with magnetic order immediately? Uh, uh, no, no, it persists above that. And this is a signature of, in most of the magnets, also in some superconductors, this is a signature of kind of like pseudo gap-like behavior that uh, there's some sort of local gap. And then also this magnetism is kind of inhomogeneous. So you don't expect, um, um, you, you see there's a lot of spectral weight. This, it's not green, this area is white. So even at low temperature, there is a lot of disorder. So the gap in momentum space, it's, it's affected by disorder. It's only kind of like a average gap and that doesn't, um, uh, that doesn't fully, cleanly disappear. So, uh, yeah, but part of it is also um, this particular plot is, it may be it's thermal broadening. So we, we see that spectroscopically, we see that it's, uh, it's disappearing, but it could be thermal. Uh, I mean, of course, thermal broadening is part of the intrinsic physics, but uh, the short answer is that it doesn't uh, directly correlate with TC. It, it pers always persists above TC. Sure. In spectroscopic measurements, yeah. Sure, and there's a second part of that question is that, does it also apply to the terbium manganese tin case? Yeah, we, we have a, a temperature dependence. Let me show you the data in terbium if I have it here, or, yeah. So for example, um, uh, oh, I don't have the temperature dependence data, but we have the field dependence data on this. Uh, it slightly increases there. I don't have the temperature dependence data on that. Sure, yeah. okay. Um, it's okay. Another question is, uh, which material was used to demonstrate the Kagami condo lattice physics? And this it was uh, MN3 um, SN. This is the um, Nakatsuji. Uh, this is, I, we, have a, we have some samples from Nakatsuji in Japan. Yeah, so it looks like the sample is very clean and clear and I did not believe uh, those results. I mean, I thought those materials, materials are dirty enough that we'll not see any fine many body physics. And um, yeah, we have a paper uh, that we will post soon. Uh, uh, it, it has been a while and then um, part, of, part of it is that we did not believe that we're seeing anybody effect in, in the system, but it, it does look like uh, these Japanese samples are very good. Yeah, it's very clean and, and, and we can clearly see uh, this beautiful condo resonance. Cool. Sure, another question is um, more general, I guess. Yeah. Why is Landau quantization uh, exciting, I guess, in this context? Oh, uh, this, is, this, this gives you, um, yeah, I, I did not explain that. Um, uh, part of it is history. Okay, so in when in back in 2011 and 10, when I declared that I have a magnetic topological insulator with a churn gap, where I showed spin texture, very phase modulation. This is a nice paper in Nature Physics. Most of the transport people did not believe me. They wanted me to show Landau quantization or something like that. So that paper got largely ignored by transport people. So then I, 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 I realized that one way to convince that community, um, our friends in that community, is that uh, actually show that the Landau fan diagram, uh, at least not, uh, I mean, I don't mean with RPS, with STM, that it has this nonlinearity, right? I mean, if you have parabolic bands, you expect linear thing. The, the fact that you have nonlinearity um, in the um, higher level uh, Landau um, um, uh, structure, uh, you should, uh, that signals, without doing spin resolve measurement or anything, although this Fermi surface, this Fermi surface is spin polarized, um, without doing that, this is a clear signature that you are dealing with massive Dirac formulas because um, you know, the, the quantization rule is different. Um, so, so this is a clear difference between massive Dirac fermions and massive parabolic bands, uh, right? So 
So this, this, uh, uh, this basically uh, a signature beyond ARPES that this is, you are really do, dealing with uh, a different, I mean, uh, relativistic fermions. I mean, the, the, uh, so this is Landau quantization is a stronger, stronger thing. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, so first thing was historical. People did not want to believe me that I have a churn gap magnet. Second thing is that it makes more easier connection with transport community. Uh, it's kind of scientific sociology. And the third thing is that, you know, this also gives you a sense that how clean the sample is, right? If you don't have a clean sam enough sample, then you would not see such a thing. And uh, with STM, it's very rarely, not every sample you uh, put under STM tip, you would see Landau quantization, apply a field. Uh, you can count, there are only a handful of samples where STM has succeeded in seeing that. And uh, Bismuth, uh, Ali Yazdani's work on Bismuth is a remarkable uh, example of that. But it's limited, Bismuth is such a clean thing. It's an unbelievable thing. So finding an STM signature of Landau quantization beyond Bismuth or Bismuth selenide, it's, it's a news at least in a, a spectroscopic community because now we can do so much fine detailed physics. Yeah, great, great. Um, yeah, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can here. Uh, yeah. The next, next question is uh, somewhat related. Uh, what is the degeneracy of the Landau level seen in terbium manganese tin? Is there any spectroscopic gap when one would when one of the Landau levels is tuned to the Fermi level? And then also, have you tried to image the Landau orbits with STM? Since we, we, we haven't, this is very, I mean, this is only last one year or so. And then, you know, we were working on it when this or lab hit the COVID thing, right? So, we, no, we, we, we haven't um, done those details yet. Uh, yeah, those things are in our list of things to do. Sure. Uh, this next question is about a cobalt manganese gallium. Uh, yeah, yeah. The question is, uh, it's about where the Fermi level is relative to the peak of the anomalous Hall conductivity. And also, is a singularity in the Berry curvature arising from the wild points or other wild nodal lines in the band structure? Yeah, uh, we believe that it's um, at least in our operating temperature, uh, from experimental point of view, it's uh, a vile loop or nodal line, uh, but I do not rule out that at lower temperature where many people have done their transport and they talk about vile nodes, I do not rule out that they, uh, uh, they will not be, at lower temperature there would not be, the loop will not break into nodes. I, so for that reason, uh, I would like to caution transport people that uh, from, uh, spectroscopic point of view, we don't have a way to, uh, it's not only us, no other RPS group, if they claim, I don't, uh, I will not believe them, although nobody has claimed that uh, they're seeing vile nodes either in this compound, there is a paper from Oxford group, they are claiming vile node, and Ilya Belopolsky and my team, uh, we have extensively uh, studied that with ARPES and we could not confirm any volume. But this does not mean at lower temperature with higher resolution people are doing, um, uh, doing transport whether a gap has opened and has not opened and, and uh, created nodes. I don't know, I cannot rule out that. But any ARPES group trying to claim that they are seeing five nodes in any of these uh, uh, Heisler or any of these um, uh, uh, cargo and magnets, uh, we don't believe them. There's a science paper that we don't believe. This is, this is not, cannot be true. This is something, I mean, um, I mean, um, if we have done extensive and honest analysis and data, um, uh, uh, I mean, reduction and all that, there's no way to prove that there is vile node in this thing with our press. But transport, low temperature transport could be different. We don't access that low temperature and we don't have effect, our effective resolution is broad. So if there is a millivolt gap, we will not be able to say that. Uh, to us, it will look like a loop. So for us, honest thing is to say that given our resolution, our sample has loop, not node. Sure, and a similar question also about cobalt manganese gallium is um, for the anomalous Hall effect, 
I think you may have answered this already, but uh, how do you confirm that doesn't originate from ferromagnetism, but is intrinsic topological origin? Yeah, so, so you know, this is, uh, I answered it uh, indirectly without going to detail. So ARPES, ARPES band structure, in this, in this particular case, it has spin orbit built in there, right? So it's, it's spin orbit uh, uh, plays an important role in the topology, I mean, plus magnetism. So the, the data, when we analyze ARPES, we're not sensitive to anything other than the uh, band uh, structure or very curvature. So uh, intrinsic anomalous Hall effect is, a, is supposed to be an, in, uh, it's a very, very curvature field or quantum geometry effect. It's not extrinsic thing, right? So we are safely, um, we are safe from that, uh, what transport people would not immediately connect. So then what we find is that the uh, anomalous hull conductivity we calculate based on the quantum geometry we extract from ARPES, that only accounts for all the transport, uh, um, um, transport signature or transport magnitude of anomalous hull. So that leaves very little room for extrinsic contribution to the anomalous hull in this compound, because very curvature already accounted for most of it. So that that is, I did not explain all of that, but uh, this is the reason. Uh, yeah, this this is a very good point because if the sample has um, non-intrinsic contribution, non-very curvature contribution to the anomalous hull, then. Uh, uh, by comparing this uh, quantum geometry calculation based on ARPES, we would fall short. Uh, it's a coincidence in this compound that we believe that this is actually a major point we make in the paper uh, published in Science last year, that uh, the uh, anomalous hull transport that is seen in this compound, it's mostly accounted for the very curvature field that we can see from the band structure. Sure, great. Yeah, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, the next is, in the first slides you showed a spin texture map. What technique was used for that measurement? Is it like polarization resolved for luminescence? Um, uh, let me see, uh, which one? Uh, the spin texture map. Uh, spin texture map um, of um, magnetic TI or yeah, this is a spin resolve ARPES. Right. So we are, we are mapping momentum, energy, and spin polarization. And we are only considering relative polarization. We're not measuring absolute polarization to, to map uh, whether the band uh, structure has very, uh, very phase. You just need to know the relative polarization. You don't have to know the absolute. So uh, although spin ARPES by itself will not tell you absolute uh, polarization of your Fermi surface or band in an absolute sense, but for topological purpose, only the relative matters that, okay, so if polarization in this direction doesn't matter magnitude, uh, whether it's opposite to that or not. So, uh, so in other words, uh, in mapping this type of texture, I only, care about the relative polarization. I don't care about magnitude and other things. Sure. Sure, the next question is, um, thank you for the nice talk. Do you expect the quantum spin liquid state to appear in these Kagami magnets? Um, and how do these magnets differ from the organic compounds which are considered a fertile ground for quantum spin liquids? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, uh, the type of topology I talked about, it's kind of like topological insulator band structure type topology. Of course, there is some magnetism is due to some interaction and then interaction modifies band structure, introduces topological twist and all that. Uh, but quantum spin liquid topology is, uh, is a different type. Uh, it, it involves a long range quantum entanglement and in this type of topological insulator and all these things, churn magnet, these are kind of like short range quantum entanglement. So the experimental uh, tools and technology would be different. I would say low temperature thermal transport type of thing would be some signature, but I am not sure how to 
prove um, uh, long range quantum entanglement in a, to prove that something is uh, quantum spin liquid. I don't know. This is some, some sort of uh, nanostructure interference tools and uh, some, some, some hybrid structure might be necessary, but I, I'm not an expert on that. I, I guess Fuan Ong can answer that in his talk. He's, um, he's um, uh, probing that. So in, in our case, we, we are also trying to do spin liquid, but uh, in a different way, like probing excitations, like a spin liquid should have, some spin liquid should have a spin on type of thing. We are trying to probe that in a scattering channel, not in a transport channel. But of course, that spectroscopic evidence for that sort of spin liquid is, um, is it doesn't go to the heart of the issue that uh, can you prove that uh, the topological order or quantum entanglement is long range? Um, yeah. It's a more subtle issue. Um, yeah. Sure. So unfortunately, we're not able, we're not able to answer all of the questions, um, but uh, try to get to as many as we can. And I'm sure some of your questions may be answered in other talks throughout the rest of the week. Um, so I'd like to thank Professor Hassan again for a wonderful talk. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. Really exciting stuff. Um, and then a reminder for everyone is that the next talk is Professor Leon Balance at uh, 3 p.m. And he'll be talking about spin liquids, so there you go. And um, another, uh, another announcement is that recall that the agenda has been changed such that we won't have any um, events on Wednesday um, as part of a um, uh, shutdown STEM movement. So we'll be sending an email about that. And uh, and otherwise, just stay tuned for the 3 p.m. talk and today's poster session. Thank you very much.